Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the continuation of the combined laboratory and clinical light committee meetings. My name is April. I'm a light team member. Um, I would ask that any committee members at this time, please click the raise your hand button so we can ensure that we bring you on as a panelist. You'll notice a refresh on your screen, but hang with it and we'll have you right back in the meeting. You'll see some housekeeping pieces there on your screen. Audience is on mute. Please submit your questions into the Q&A function and our link team members will assist with those in between the topic sessions. Uh, and this is the last session that we have today. Uh, we hope you've had a very great day and now I'm going to turn it over to Swapna. Great, uh, thanks April and welcome back everybody. Um, so there was, uh, we're gonna jump back in. So this is the combined, sorry, this is the combined lab and clinical meeting, sorry, let me turn on the camera. Um, and so we are gonna jump back into the discussion. Um, I think when we left off this morning, there was one pending question, but I'm looking related to COVID, but actually the person who asked the question isn't on. So maybe we will uh, hold off on that for the moment. And then if she joins later on in the next hour, then we will go back to that question. Um, and then the other discussion that we were gonna um, continue on was uh, the working group to define or clarify um, the use cases for panels and groups and value sets, et cetera. And I guess I'm wondering, I'm not sure we actually need more discussion on that because we actually have created a work group and Tim already set it up. And so I was gonna show you the link um, at the end of the session. Uh, so that's already all set. So we just need people to sign up for that and I can show you how later. Um, all right, so maybe we will just uh, then jump in to our preview of search link and let me go ahead and share my screen and we're going to do a few slides and then actually do a live preview. All right, excellent. Uh, so this is going to be a bit of a tag team with, uh, with me and Tim. <coughs> and so just to give a little bit of background and actually for those of you that were on uh, Brene and John's talk in the last hour on um, searching. Um, this is an excellent, uh, or that was an excellent setup for this talk. And so the existing search link application was introduced about 10 years ago and has really great search features, but you have to know the syntax. Um, and it also doesn't include searching for parts, answer lists, or groups. And as I mentioned this morning, uh, Rama, you can search for parts and answer lists, but you can't search for groups. And so we're super excited um, about developing this new uh, search link. And, you know, related to what we talked about this morning, just as the number of terms has grown and there's more and more content available, we definitely need a new search tool. And so uh, we decided to build uh, search link 2.0, which is just what I'm calling it for today, but I don't know what it's actually going to be called. So don't, don't quote me on that. Um, and basically it builds uh, upon an API that we've been working on that's connected to the link database that accesses uh, the link table as well as a lot of other information in the link database uh, that's related to um, you know, the groups and the parts and the answer lists and all of that. And it also takes advantage of solar indexing. And it's really been a team effort. And so you know, the filtering functionality, uh, Jamie and I have been talking about that for a long time. Um, John and Steven have been working on the API and then Tim has been building the UI and then the whole team has been testing. So it's been actually a really fun project, <clears throat> excuse me, that we've all worked on together. And I do just want to mention that the API and I mentioned this morning, so currently it's basically just being utilized for the search link user interface. But if there are developers out there who are interested in potentially gaining access to the API, um, let us know because that's something that we've been pondering. And so key features again, you know, being able to search for more than just terms, um, having a sidebar with filters that let you basically narrow down your results and the filters are essentially exposing the search syntax that's available, um, you know, already in the search link, but that isn't publicly uh, public facing or immediately obvious. And then there's also a search history. And really the difference is, you know, going from searching from glucose, seeing there's 956 terms and not being, you know, quite certain what to do next versus doing the same search in the new search link, getting the same 956 terms, but then seeing that you're actually able to filter and get to exactly uh, what you need. 
Um, and for those of you keeping track, I know Brene mentioned that when you search for glucose, there's 939 terms. And that's actually if you exclude the deprecated ones. So in case you're wondering where that discrepancy comes from. And so if you want to help test this out and uh, make it even better before it gets launched, then uh, please sign up at link.org slash beta. And I think a bunch of people have already signed up, which is really super exciting. All right, so with that, Tim, I'm going to turn it over to you for the first part. I can stop sharing. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen? Yep. Okay, great. Um, this just to set the stage, this is what the current search link looks like. I'm, hopefully everyone's familiar with it. Just want to kind of uh, also say at the outset, you know, this, like Swatner said, this was a very fun project or has been a fun project for all of us. I think I say that for every link project, but uh, I'm definitely me at this time. Um, so without further ado, this is kind of the, the, the homepage, the landing page that you will reach, which is kind of analogous if you like just go to google.com. Um, Hopefully we'll make it a little bit more user friendly than the, the previous version. So it kind of guides people through searching process and, and provides answers to uh, common questions and, and help. Um, but I'm going to go through it from kind of a, a developer's point of view and then I'll hand it off back to Swapna and she'll kind of go from it from a terminologist point of view. Um, so I'll just kind of show some of the, the main uh, key features. Um, like up here, this will eventually um, will be a menu where you can change your options, uh, different preferences you have within the web app. Uh, but then the, obviously this is kind of the, the main search area where you can compose your search. Um, and then we also, as Swapna mentioned, uh, you can change the scope so you can look for parts and answer lists in groups. Um, we have a couple of, of headings up, up here, which we'll obviously I'll explain later in a second. Um, and then here is just kind of features in terms of, you know, quick searches and maybe just common things that we would like to draw people's attention to. Um, and obviously we have the new work group um, and this is where we, someone could uh, um, sign up for that. Um, and also, I will mention this is a private development platform. So if you try to go out here and, and access it, you can't, unfortunately. But when you have people sign up for the beta, we'll be able to provide you access that way. So let's go ahead and just do a quick search. Um, say if I search for like COVID, um, you'll get the list of, re of responses back, kind of like what you would do currently with search link. But down on the left-hand side, you'll be able to do a, a number of different options. First of all, the, the results you'll see up, up, in, up front. But let's say if you want to just search within your results and find, um, I don't know, like a um, type emergency, then you can see, obviously, it, it's it, a kind of a quick drill down but you also have these search filters um, and these we've kind of closed or collapsed these other um, but you can always click on them if you want um, and one of the cool things is too like if you didn't know what this um, bld dot dot was you can mouse over it and actually see a an explanation so hopefully that helps out a few people um, let's say if i just you know wanted to, to click on a couple just to narrow the results that i got um, I could then apply that search or apply those filters and then the, get the results back. And also just say that, you know, this is a uh, sortable table. So if you wanted to sort by component, you would click once for ascending or click again to do descending. So there's a lot of different um, changing of the view um, that you can do. And also one of the really cool things that I think is um, another kind of team effort in terms of creating what we called the card view, which is, I think is a really compelling way to kind of look at the same data set in a totally new, totally new way. And we've also put, uh, you can kind of flip the card in essence and see the kind of the, the, the additional information. So if you want to just click that, whenever you see a description, you can actually see more information. So that's a really compelling way. And Swatman and I discovered this yesterday. It, also, if you find a couple different terms that you're looking at and you want to see um, the descriptions on, you can see them both kind of at the same time and kind of look at and compare them together. Um, so that's kind of the search. And again, Swapman will go through some of the other elements. Um, the search history, just like you within your web browser, you have a, 
um, a browser history, we have kind of the same thing. Um, so you can always go back to see, you know, if there's a search that you did maybe a week or so ago, um, and kind of the same as we have with the, uh, the main search results. Uh, like say, if you wanted to look for a, a promise term that you were looking up previously, oh, there's that search that I did a while back. Oops, I corrected. Um, and then you can just click on that and see the exact same um, results. Um, we're also going to be adding in a help feature. It's not fully developed yet, as you can see, but it'll be a lot more tips and tricks and um, best practices you can do to follow. And a lot of it's kind of following, um, if you were attendance of uh, um, Brene and, and John's presentation previously, um, a lot of those same tips. I think it's one of the things that I think we all like about this uh, application the most is it's kind of backward compatible. So all those little tips and tricks of you know using those field names, um, so like you know class lab, um, you can do that as well. And actually, these filters um, do that same process. So in essence, it's kind of a, an intelligent way to apply those same search filters through a, an easy to use interface. Um, there's a lot of other features we're working to build. So yeah, if you could sign up for the beta, we'll hopefully uh, have a lot of people that can test this out and um, I'll hand it back over to Swapna to kind of talk more about everything. Tim, before you go, can you click on search history again? Yes. So, and that, what is that? Okay, so it, it changes. So. Um, the, because what I was wondering is, so this is basically everything that, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get a sense of when does it decide to actually, you have a history to record here, if you're changing what you're typing in the main search bar. Um, and I ask, I guess that whenever you hit search or hit return, it throws an entry in here. Correct. Is that kind of what's going on? Because what would be interesting is if you could star these things so that you could say this search is something that I want to keep around. Yes, as a matter of fact, that's one of the things we've been talking about and just haven't implemented yet is actually saving common searches so that on the home page you could, you know, have a list of, of your saved searches. You can always go back to them mm -hmm. at a click of a button. Yeah. What was this? Also on search results, what is this? the far left column then the star? there um it's oh, search the, no, the search results tab yeah this is a status status um meaning active i, I should oh oh, if oh. I'm, let me just do a uh, can i ask a question or two uh, tim yes firstly let me just give my compliments to all the chefs chefs <laughs> It's glorious. I mean, it, it's just glorious. I'm going to not be able to sleep tonight. <laughs> but, but there's a couple of questions. Does it still do the squirrely things if you type a word that's not known at the top? The squeak, you know, the, like, like in Word. The, the other version, if you, if it's certainly. Oh, normal. like the spell, like the spell check thing? Yeah. Like, well, just one, like it one, underlines it? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Well, that's one question. Um, uh, uh, and do the filters intersect? Do they? I mean, if you do six filters, it's the end of all yes. them. Yes. And I was going to show a little bit of that. Okay. And you and you're gonna you got the star in the syntax still, you know, for yep. uh, uh, wild cards and stuff. All the uh, existing syntax will still work, 100. percent Oh, okay. Okay. It's 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 really nice. Yeah, I, I love the fact that you have you're actually just showing the syntax that you're crafting by hitting on the filters. That obviously makes a lot of sense. And the other thing that I'm gonna really tune in on is how we align what we're doing there with what you would use to define a value set, right? So um, you know, I think we've all potentially, if you've played with these sorts of things, run into situations where you can express a query into a code system in order to retrieve a subset of concepts. But you can't really, it's hard to actually construct that same thing in a value set, um, you know, kind of definition or in fire speak, uh, you know, a content logical definition. Well, I don't want to get into value sets, but um, 
I've always been troubled by these answer things that don't have a question on them because you struggle knowing what's it really for, but that's separate. Uh, whatever, can you, um, can you export like you could in the other one? It, what you've, what you've- That found? will be added. Um, just like we can uh, currently export from the COVID terms page. Well, um, no, no, I'm just talking about export in a plain old, uh, you can do that Rama and I think, I don't know if you can do it in the other one. You, you know, can't. <laughs> But you, yeah, there's you a can. hack you can use to, to do it. Yeah, you can <laughs> but, copy paste. Uh, copy yeah. paste with a specific approach to doing it. You have to get the, so having the ability to, to, to just splat out, send those things out on a tab delimited file is going to be really well, valuable. It, it's, I use it all the time, but I, I think it's pretty well developed in Realma. But so that will be another really valuable thing because then you can play with them other ways, yeah. save them, send them, you know. It, but this is gorgeous. It's just gorgeous. We, this is Jamie. We also have some questions online. I don't know if we want to wait until you're finished. Um, You'll be to hand it back to Swapna so you can kind of sure. go okay, over the- Okay, and then the, we can uh, answer, ask them at the end. Sure. Yeah, and I just wanted to show a couple of things. Um, so I was going to show the parts and the answer lists and the group searches. Okay, um, you're seeing the search link? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so basically I just, you know, I wanted to show a couple of other things. And so um, one thing I just wanted to point out was that just the way Tim searched for COVID, if you search for SARS, you can actually see a lot of the same terms that come up and that's due to the synonymy that we have within LINK. And I just thought that was an interesting thing just when, you know, when we were talking yesterday and trying to figure out who was going to show what, and I already had a SARS you know, search on my list and he had a COVID search and it turned out that, you know, it brings up a lot of the same results, which I think is kind of cool. Um, but anyway, so I was going to show just a couple other things like with the filters. So let's say, you know, you look for glucose and then um, um, as you showed, you know, you have the 956 terms, but let's say, you know, you realize, okay, but I only want urine glucose terms. And I only want the ones that are active. So if you can click on active, and then you come down here and you kind of start seeing why there's so many terms. But anyway, let's say, whoops, yep, highlight it. So then you go to apply and then you see, okay, so now I have 106 and you can see a lot of them are challenge terms, but it's a more, you know, much more manageable list. And then let's say you realized, oh, okay, I actually really only want the 24 hour ones. So then you can go down to 24 hours and you can, you know, click on that, whoops, you click on that and then narrow it down. And, you know, like Rob pointed out, it's nice seeing the query here because you can see how the search is building. And if you went to the current search link, you could actually type in this, you know, the same, well, syntax is slightly different, like without the equal signs. But essentially, you could type in the same thing and get the exact same results. But now we've made it more visible. And so if somebody doesn't know, oh, this is what the property field is called, or this is what the timing or system is called, or these are the different options available, now you actually have that, you know, in the filters, which is, I think, really cool. Um, and then basically you can click here and switch what you're looking for. So you can see link, part, answer list, and group. So if we go to, oops, if we go to part, and then let's say look for stars, because that's my favorite search, then you can actually see, okay, we have a whole bunch of component parts, only 36 of them. Um, for all different variations of either SARS or something that has synonymy with SARS. Um, and so you can see all the SARS-CoV-2 parts, and then you can also see the older parts um, for you know, SARS coronavirus or Bonnie and SARS-like and SARS-related, et cetera. Yay. <laughs> you can search <laughs> the scope. I love it. Hey, it's really great. All right, and then answer list. Or let's say you want all answer lists that have the word, you know, that, or have the answer detected in them. And so initially, again, you know, wow, 78 of them, you know, that's a little bit overwhelming. But the really cool thing for these is that you can actually, you know, you can expand and you can actually see what the answers are right away, which I think is really cool. But then the other thing you can do is if you want to look for the ones that are used most commonly and these numbers are a little bit confusing right now, but just remember the first column is the number of links that are using that answer list. And then this column, the second column is the number of answer lists. And so 
there's one answer list that's being used by 1,023 blanks. And so if you apply that, and right now there's a little bug, so it's going to say zero, but I'm just going to take out that equals. Um, so this one list is used by over a thousand link terms, and it's just the detected, not detected, which makes sense. Um, but you know, you can go back. I'm just going to take this off, and we're going to add a way to you know remove the filters as well. That's uh, that's in process. Um, but let's say you only want answer lists that have you know two answers each. You don't really you know that you're basically looking for an ordinal list, so you don't want one with you know 13 answers or 18 answers. So then you can just Click on two and apply. Oops, then I have to cut the little equals again, sorry. And then you can see all the variations. So you have detected, not detected. And then you have, you know, some variations like not detected or high risk HPV detected or not detected increased risk, present not detected. So, you know, flavors of similar things. And these are the sorts of lists um, that could be attached to terms as example lists because you know, one, one package insert might say, okay, the results should be reported as detected, not detected. Another one might say they should be reported as present, not detected. But, you know, really it depends on which test kit you're using. And so the exact answer list that's attached to the lab term isn't as important as, you know, as matching the answer strings, basically. Um, I, so this, I, I, I one wonders, I mean, this is like, I'm, I'm like Plum. I'm like, oh my God. So, um, but it makes me, it makes me wonder. Um, I think that we, you know, we're saying by doing this, it's always been there that we want people to pick these answer lists and use them. And, um, and I just want to confirm that we're all in agreement <laughs> that that's true. Cause you know, I can't, I can't tell you how many times in fire right now, as well as other places, it's easier to see in fire. People are making lists like this, you know? And, um, and so I think, are, am I correct in saying that we would like to say, hey, go here, search for these answer lists, use these answer lists instead of making up codes independently for, you know, you know, I just ha I have no idea, but I'll bet there's a hundred different flavors of detected, not detected. So that's interesting because I didn't realize that people are making these like sets like these in fire. They they do. I mean, obviously, <clears throat> uh, there's a lot of other things too, but. But are they like, are they SNOMED CT codes or what? Like, and, you know, uh, all, well, it's going to either be SNOMED CT codes if you have SNOMED and people are being, you know, kind of have drank the Kool-Aid, um, or they'll be picking HL7 codes that exist, of which there's, you know, all kind. Of, there are probably more than one way of saying something like detected, not detected, certainly yes, no. Um, in fact, I know of a value set that is yes, no, something else that people want to create. So it just, you know, I, I, you know, without kind of speaking to the what's happening now, I'm, I'm wondering, do we agree that these things as lists, remember these were not created as an independent list. They were created as a, a list to a particular need. Right. And then we've reused them. And so I just want to confirm that we're comfortable in saying that, you know, link list 74, 744-4 uh, is something that we agree should be used in any case where what you're looking to determine is whether something is detected or not detected. Do we agree? That's, that's certainly agree. My, my thought. <laughs> I mean, can I soften that a bit? You know, whatever we say we want, after all these years, the world is really unruly. <laughs> I, I mean, it's beyond belief how unruly it is. And we've come up, I think, you know, it's gotten more ruly. I mean, it's gotten better. <laughs> but I, I don't think we can do it by law. I think- No, 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 no. don't, don't oh, get he, me wrong, Clan. He, he I'm not- He said, do, we, do we want people to do it? Yeah, I'm saying, do we want that? I, there's no way we'll make them do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Encourage, <laughs> but I still want to do it, encourage. But by term, not just by list. There may be cases where you know there's a there's a either a historical or a cultural reason. You don't say detected, not detected. You say 
present or absent. I mean, that's oh yeah, yeah, it. absolutely. No, I'm, don't, 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 yeah. don't course, misinterpret yeah, course, my yeah. words. I'm just saying yeah. that what's, you know, again, there's been, I think, over the years, we we get these issues with regards to especially things that we mark as normative, right? And and so we have to to think about that in in in, in this context. But but Stan yeah. has it exactly right. I'm asking, given now that this is easy, because prior to this it was really not easy, right, to find these. So now by surfacing this, I think we we need to agree among ourselves that that we would encourage people to look to find what they need, and if they find what they need, they should use it. Yeah, yeah. Ideally, they yeah. take it. Um, back. Yeah. yeah, I'd say that, and um, you know, this is a transition into on the details pages for these, right? It it shows you that they actually already exist as fire value sets. So further, you don't even right. need to pick right. them up yourself. You can just That's my, get to it from one. Exactly. Life. You know, right. really so, easy. <laughs> Yeah, so here's the fire value set links, and then here's actually it also shows all the terms that use each particular answer list. So this is Susan Rob. I'm one of those that have made all these values in VSAC. You know that all these value sets we've got determinate, indeterminate, yes, no, pause, neg, they're all, but they are, have SNOMED codes, and these here they have no meaning and, well, unless they're in the list. So thank you. So let's talk about that. <laughs> because no, I get that, um, you know, in the sense that in one, remember that the, the world, you know, you know, unfortunately, SNOMED isn't available for everybody. And so the fact that there's some who would rather use SNOMED and some who, uh, you know, would rather or could, can use LOINC, I think is an important conversation, but it doesn't change the fact that by just making these available, we would say um, these are intended to be used as independent ways of, you know, kind of crafting these sets of, of answers. I hear what you're saying, and I, and I agree that's a point of some conversation, but, it, but it's got parameters that aren't universally applied. And in fairness, there is a place to put a description to slash definition with each answer, and many of them do have SNOMED codes with them. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I was just pointing that out. If you can close it this way. Yeah. Yeah, and that's been a work in progress. And we actually, there's a question about this in the last session. Um, you know, we're, we've been adding these as we've had time and resources, and also as there are SNOMED codes. So I think for some of these, like positive, none detected, I think this particular answer string. There's no SNOMED code for none detected or not detected, I believe. Um, and so that's why sometimes you see lists with, you know, one answer map to a SNOMED code, but not the other one. And you can see how much they've been doing as you've been at these sessions. It's, it's immense and extraordinary. And they get a million a year from, from NLM and the other company gets five and a half. Well, okay, let's, let me, let me move on with the demo. <laughs> Okay. Sorry about that. Swap, That's okay. Swapnam, Swapnam, yes. may I make a comment? Yep. I think the answer is I think we need to be careful because, as Swapna said, as uh, Andrea Pictu said in the chat, and as I comment also, we need to be careful with what is cleared in the IVD package insert. Yes. So I, we we I don't think we can change the answer list from what is um, um, cleared by the FDA unless taking the risk to run to some issues, which I do not uh, really want to, to try. Oh, oh, you're talking about what's in the what's in the label, right? Yes, absolutely. If you label positive, I'm not sure you are you are allowed to change positive by detected. No, not, yeah, I'm sure you're not. The <laughs> discussion we had some, some years ago. And yeah. that's exactly yeah. why, yeah. you know, for the lab terms, why the answer lists are attached as example answer lists, exactly for that reason, because you know, you can still use that lab term, even if you're not using the particular <laughs> answer list that's attached to it. You just have to pick the right, you know, answer codes or SNOMED codes or whatever you're using. Um, okay, let me just show groups really quick. So I just want to show a couple of different things here. So one is just to show, here's the star, so that works. Um, and here's a couple of different groups. Is it big enough? Can you guys see? Um, 
I can make it bigger if, if need be. But basically, when I look for smoking um, or smoke star, um, there's three different groups that come up. One is the group for these uh, document ontology terms, evaluation and management of smoking cessation note. And these are actually, this group is created uh, based on a query, just looking for this particular component. And then these two, the second two groups are actually based on internal tagging. And I know we kind of mentioned that earlier today, but we have a way to tag certain terms with certain attributes inside the LOIC database. And so these two groups have been created based on that type of tagging. And so this one is for smoking biochemical markers. And then the other one is for smoking related terms. And you can see the biochemical marker one, you know, at least the components are somewhat related, but these smoking related terms, there's no way you would be able to gather this collection of codes based on a query, you know, just just using filters and putting together value sets. So for something like this, it's really a manual process, which uh, personally, I think these types of groups are the ones that are most valuable because they're so time consuming for people to put together. And so if we can provide a single source, um, then I think there's great value in that. Um, so swap, this, I was actually thinking about this elsewhere too. Okay, so once you go here and you find a group, for example, that, that you want to use as a, as a group, <laughs> and um, then you want to take that group and you want to use it as a um, as one of your ands, for example, someplace else, like in the other search sections. Like I want to look for the things that have this, this, and this, and in and are in this group. Can can we do that? Not right now. No, they're independent. The four the groups. Would, would it? Yeah, because because. What I'm thinking is if we can identify a way of, of identifying a group, then it could just be one of the criteria that you add into the search um, semantics elsewhere used. Does that make, am I making sense? Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. And uh, like, I'm imagining even starting with like for the term search, even if you had a filter for in a group, you know, like that would be some yeah. place to start. It would be better. I, that's if you could... actually where I, when I saw that, I was thinking, gosh, it'd be nice to also apply group. But at the, but you would have this, you know, like huge list on the side. I don't know if that's really helpful, but right. But at a minimum, being able to to say have a way of defining a group in the semantics of search elsewhere. Yeah, and you can actually see. And I realize now we're sort of going off on a tangent, but if you actually look at the details page for this term as it exists now, you'll actually see that it's in a group. So here's a member of these panels and then member of yeah. these groups as well. So, you know, we have the linkages. It's just a matter of how to expose that, basically. Yeah. Um, just a couple other ones. So here we have uh, social determinants. We have six different groups for the different domains. And again, you can sort of see, uh, you know, you can just expand and one thing that I want to mention here was that, you know, like I said, this is, it's been a manual process using keywords that we've been using to update these with every release. Um, but I'm sure there's ones that we've missed. And so if you, you know, if you look at these and you're wondering, well, why isn't this link term that I use all the time? Like, why isn't this in here? Or, you know, if there's clearly ones that are missing that we just overlooked, please let us know and we'll add them. Um, so I wanted to throw that out there. Um, and then the last one I just wanted to show was, you know, we have different types of groups. So we have a lot of lab groups. Then we also have documents and uh, we have a lot of radiology groups too. And actually, like, I think this one's pretty cool because we have groups by the region imaged. And so you can basically look um, based on the codes that are in, you know, each of these groups to see, has my patient had any recent, you know, ECK imaging or pelvis imaging uh, without having to individually search for all of the link codes that are, uh, you know, that are associated with those. So, you know, these span modalities um, and laterality, um, but basically gives you, you know, you can see these numbers probably add up to close to 6,000 because that's how many radiology codes we have and each term has a region imaged. And so these all together should be all of our radiology codes. So, um, so could you like say, I only want to see the MR images within those groups? How, how would you do that? 
so you certain, these certain groups certain. are defined based on the region image like that's what the group is for so you yeah. can't really narrow down but you could go back to uh you know the other search the term search to yeah. look for let's say whole body in an mr and then you basically get that result but that wouldn't be a group code it would just be yeah we need a, we need that group in those other search sections that would really be useful um so i guess should we are, should we open it up for questions? Sure. There was one thing I forgot to mention, I'm sorry. Um, uh -huh. This interface will also be internationalized so that Great. it'll be available in at least six different languages um, at launch. So so I, could I ask a question? Mm -hmm. uh, Tim, Tim, why isn't it faster? <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like negative time, oh, brother. Button, well, you know? yeah. negative. And this is for you, Clem. This is your column here, the search duration. We're, and oh. we're actually, there's several things we can work on to make it even faster. Um, this is oh, like man, using I, some I, of the CDN stuff. I was stuff. kidding. I was kidding. I thought we were going faster. Performance is always the best I, I was losing time, saving microseconds out of my life with it. But two other questions. On the uh, part search, you mentioned is the are, are the synonyms and the names both represented as rows? No, so you don't see the synonyms, but the synonyms no, no. help you find no, no. the part. I, I misunderstood. Um, let's see. There's one other question, and uh, never mind. I'll, it'll come back. Oh, I have I have new a, a, a new love for for. Uh, for groups that when you have this in this perspective it changes the whole the whole picture of of what what you can do with them so yeah and there's some sort of goofy things just in a way that we've created the groups that i think aren't ideal oops sorry that aren't ideal for searching so just yesterday i was looking for blood pressure and i couldn't find anything because the group is you know defined as intravascular systolic or something like that so you know things like that i was thinking it would be really cool to be able to add synonyms to the groups or somehow make use of the part synonyms that are already there but then you know when those are those terms are used in a particular group then to be able to use that synonymy to find the groups as well because otherwise like it's almost impossible to know what to search for. Like yesterday, actually, I looked for SARS and I was like, why can't I find the groups that I created? And it turned out because I'd called them something. I'd called them SARS-CoV-2 antibody detection. And so when I looked for SARS, I couldn't find them. Um, but you know, that that's sort of silly. So it, some of this is just based on how we've built them out, but I think we could, you know, we could add synonymy or utilize synonymy from other areas, or just like you were talking about. Um, to make the searching much more powerful as well. Robin, we have a few questions um, mm -hmm. uh, coming through. Okay, so there are uh, several questions about uh, whether panel search um, will be part of it as well as multi-axial hierarchy um, uh, as part of this new search. So, Multi-axial hierarchy will, is not going to be at least in the initial rollout, but we would really like that to be in you know, future development. In terms of the panels, that's a little bit tricky. So we have a panel browser, and, but that's a little bit different. That's where you can just basically browse all of the panels in Link, and I think it's just link.org slash panels. Um, but like here, if you search for SARS, you can actually narrow it down to panels by looking at the class. And so you can see, you know, when I did my search for SARS, there's four terms that are in panel.micro. And so you can actually narrow down to the panels that way. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's, you know, it's a little bit different from the panel browser where you can just sort of look at all panels across everything. Yeah, that the question about panels came from um, Leanna Harmon. So I, I don't know if she has a follow up, but she's and in here as well, you can, you know, you can click on it and you get the details page to see exactly what's in the panel as well. All right, Swap, then we had another question. Um, are you considering incorporating the local code mapping into the online search tool by uploading an input file? Users can then choose to share their mappings and allow for collaboration. Um, that is very interesting. Um, 
I had not thought of that, <laughs> but I think that's a great idea. I think right now we're just building, you know, we're trying to just get sort of the basic thing going so we can roll it out. But I, I think the other piece of this is that Realma over the next few years probably will be phased out. And so we're trying to either in this, you know, in this tool or in, you know, a companion tool, we want to be able to build out some of the mapping features that are in Realma. So I think something like that will definitely become very important um, at that point. Yeah, great. We also well, have I would just, oh. could I just, I would just say we yeah. do have our community mappings available online if people do want to share mappings. That's available right now for them mm -hmm. to add their mappings and to browse. Right. Yeah, that's true. Um, and I, I, I guess I'm not sure. I don't think that's actually built into this yet. Um, but yes. Thank you, John. All right. And we have another question from John, actually, John Snyder. Um, due to multiple loin codes for the same component being very similar, uh, which may be a change in just one of the axes, is there a way to compare multiple loin codes to see the difference between them? Um, I mean, I guess you would be able to see just based on the grid, right? Like in this case, the first two, they look similar at first glance because they're both SARS coronavirus to AV panel. But then when you get over here to the system, you see that, you know, one also accepts blood and is a rapid amino assay. So for, you know, more point of care testing. Um, I don't, John, does that answer your question? Or are you talking about more in the filtering side? It, it makes me think of like in Brene's talk where she um, mentioned the headset, you know, with a, or headphones and you're buying some headphones and, you know, online you want to compare mm -hmm. the different headphones that are available out there. But that, in that case, you're looking at headphones that are the same, essentially, you know, you just want to know which one to pick. Um, oh. Or maybe they're similar. Oh, there you are. I swap, yeah, I just got promoted. Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations. So, <laughs> um, so the question was more like, um, if you had the option to select multiple link codes, if they had answer lists, and then you'd be able uh, to compare the two link codes in a column fashion, and then be able to see the difference between the two answer lists? Um, no, short answer is okay. no, you cannot yeah. do that right now. Okay. Yeah. But that goes back to the, you know, if we can combine searches across the four areas, um, I think that would be excellent. Thank you. So there's a quick question that doesn't really apply to the new tool, but more is about groups. Can a link belong to more than one group? Yes. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's a short answer. Yes, it can. Um, yeah, like, so, you know, like in radiology. So basically, if we have a group for um, region imaged head, you know, so you're going to have a bunch of groups, or sorry, a bunch of link codes in there. Um, But then we can also search a different way. Maybe this wasn't the best example, but let's say, let's say you're looking for, you know, lower extremity. So you have these codes, um, you know, all these ankle codes right up right at the top. So then let's say we actually look for ankle. And then you can actually see we have a ton of smaller groups with two and three and four codes in them for, you know, CT ankle. And this one's, you know, one's for right, one's for left. Um, but otherwise they're exactly the same, or we have a bunch that have four. So we have unspecified laterality, left, right, and bilateral, but all of these ankle terms are also in that region imaged, uh, lower extremity group as well. So, um, yeah, so they can definitely fall under different, uh, into different groups. So, hey, great. Uh, thank you. So I'm going to, if you put, if you search an ankle, for the groups and added another word, would that intersect with the current search? It might go to what Rob was looking for. Let's see. Yep. You'd, you'd have just a subset. Right. Oh, all right. Are you, yeah, so does that mean but those are the CTs that are just within that group? No, so these groups are specific to CT angle. Are specific to CT, yeah. So it's kind of, but no, I'm thinking of using groups where you have other complex searches. As, yeah. Right, like I think Rob wants to narrow within the group, but then it no longer will be that yeah. group. Yeah, essentially use the group as, a, as maybe a, a, a overarching, yeah, 
general uh, start point and then do other searches that we could we do in, in, in the other kind of main search right. component. Rob, excuse me, are you thinking about doing modality, search by modality versus well, body it, structure or? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't have an example. I know okay. there are groups that aren't, that don't line out exactly well with existing, um, you know, part elements, right? So like the, the blood pressure one that you showed or the, I don't know, there's other ones where they aren't dependent on, this gets to the point that I made at the, you know, on our earlier session, and that there's some of the value of groups is that it groups based on a uh, context or something that we don't actually have as a defining element of the concept and therefore it provides additional information about it. And, yeah. um, and so being able to use that in the context of the things that we do actually have as defining elements is good. Okay, well, I guess in the interest of time, if there's no other questions, then maybe we should um, go on because there's a couple other things to to cover as well. Sound okay? All right, let me stop sharing for a second so I can bring up the right thing. Um, let's see, sorry, I have to look at my list to see what's next. Okay, so next is Newcomb updates. Okay, so this should be fairly quick, but um, uh, so this, I didn't realize it's totally switching gears, so sorry, sorry about that. Um, but just a little bit of background. So the unified code for units of measure was uh, developed by Gunther Shadow and Clint McDonald um, in the late 90s. And its purpose is to facilitate um, unambiguous electronic communication of the units of measure associated with any type of quantitative uh, result. And it's, you know, it's, it's a terminology, but it's not a terminology like Link in which, you know, you get a table with a bunch of codes um, and then the names, but it's basically a set of terminal symbols for each unit and then a grammar for how to combine, uh, for how to combine those together. And so recently the specification moved to a new home. Um, so for many years, Gunther had been maintaining it just by himself, um, but for the last several years, it had some trouble with the website and spam issues and things. And so um, I think the site was, you know, sometimes down and the track ticketing system had been turned off and requests for new units um, basically hadn't been processed in a few years. Um, but about, I guess, actually almost a year ago now, uh, thanks to a donation from uh, Clem, thank you, Clem, um, to our program, we actually purchased the ucom.org domain. And then we've been working with Gunther to move the specification from unitsofmeasure.org to ucom.org. And then the original site has been redirected to point to the new site, so both sites are working. And so currently we've essentially just replicated uh, the previous site, except we've added, um, you know, spam blocking strategies and removed um, actually, I think it's like several thousand spam tickets that had built up over the years. And then we've re-enabled the track ticketing system. And uh, work in progress includes updating the terms of use, um, also formalizing a process for managing new requests, kind of like we do for LOINC and, you know, submissions that come in. Um, and then we're also working on creating a UCOM committee that would be similar to the LOINC committees. And there's a UCOM board of advisors and everybody who's currently on that is actually interested in participating in the new uh, UCOM committee. So we're really excited about that. So that we'll have everybody's expertise, um, but we also welcome new members. And so, oops, I guess that's, sorry, that's in two slides. Um, okay, I'll just go to that for a second. So if you're interested in participating on the UCOM committee, um, you can send a message to ucom support at link.org. And we haven't figured out all the details yet, but most likely the committee would meet, um, you know, anywhere from like quarterly to, you know, potentially monthly at the beginning, if there's a lot of tickets to work through, and then we could, you know, meet less frequently over time. Um, the committee would basically review pending requests for new youth new units or updates, like recently, actually, um, Avogadro's number um, and um, another constant were updated, which is kind of funny because it was a constant, so it seemed <laughs> funny that it was updated, but anyway, um, so things like that, you know, so the group basically would meet and, you know, review those and then other issues uh, like versioning, frequency of publication, adoption, I think would be really interesting to, uh, to talk about as well. And then going backwards one slide, um, the other thing that we're working on is um, putting up an adoption page 
uh, that could host translations, and then also the common UCOM units file, which is currently released with the link release every time um, we could actually move that to a new home. And then we'd also like to publish um, a full table of example UCOM units that are used in LINK. And um, Rob, I know we had talked about this a few months ago, um, and I think this would be useful to some people. And also potentially adding uh, the property, because I know that's a very confusing point um, in terms of how the properties and units match up. So, you know, so that would be another thing that we could put on the adoption page. And then we're also just working on a general you know, review and update of uh, the site um, in general. Can you, can you help me? So the word yeah. adoption in this context is intended to mean just the way that adopt UCOM or something? How, how people are using UCOM essentially. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because, and then, you know, one of the things that, that's turned out to be kind of interesting and you could I potentially argue that it makes sense <laughs> is that there some of the example UCOM units that are in LOINC aren't in the common UCOM units file. Yes. Which has caused us some grief at times. <laughs> right. Well, because yeah, because there's some there's some like terms. Maybe that are they're very rare, rare. But <laughs> right. Right. Okay. So yeah. So that's why that that's the reasoning behind creating just the separate table of all example UCOM units that are used in LOINC so that you would have the whole list without calling it common. Is, is, are, you, are you finished with that part? Yep. Okay, because I'll be talking a lot more about UCOM on uh, Thursday. <clears throat> and we have already built a much, much larger, larger table of you know, stupid units mapped to UCOM units and their properties. And we found a number of problems, you know, these absolute things that are not so absolute. And we'll talk about them. And I just want to point out that it, we have a website that allows people to translate terms. That's one of the big values of UCOM. It's computable uh, between two commensurate units and validated. It's getting 100 million hits a year. So I, that was startling. I'm on average, nine, nine, 9 million a month. So. That's this amazing. Is, I, I think we yeah. actually have a link to the tool. I think it's on the UCOM site, but I'll, I'll double check to um, make sure it's. Yeah, yeah, that's we correct. should. Yeah. Um, and, and well, anyway, and there's and it and it validates, and then it also does conversion, and it'll also convert um, substance to mass units if you provide a, um, a a molecular weight, which surprisingly are not the same everywhere, <laughs> because it depends right. on the isotope. I mean, if you get down to the seventh, that's no place. Um, so that's all I had for UCOM. Are there questions? Yeah, I, I would just add, you know, Clem, you, maybe you're going to talk about this on Thursday, but this using UCOM thing, I think gets, for many people who are exposed to UCOM, they have no clue why UCOM was created, <laughs> which was for the issues that you were just describing. And no one uses that, you know, they don't use it. They, all they do is complain about the fact that it's a weird way of representing a unit that they have to deal with. And, and I think we need to make clear that it has this other use encourage that functionality where appropriate. And then, um, you know, it, this gets to the adoption page, just make it kind of um, plain and simple for the vast majority of people who, you know, are exposed to UCOM. All it is is about representing that, that string that's a unit. Well, if people are gonna combine data across institutions, they're gonna have to have a way to convert everything to a common unit, unit or it's not gonna help that much. Even if they get the codes right, the line code right, if they, you know, people won't be able to average them or follow trends or anything. So I think uh, people will wake up, but the, the hit rates on this translation thing startled me. I, I, you know, we don't, we don't have that. That's getting to the stuff like NCBI gets, you know, hit, hit rates. I, not hit rate. This is actually using the API to either validate or to translate something. <clears throat> Swap no, this is John. One question. Um, I know that there's a UCOM value set, I believe, in VSAC, and there's been some problems on the CCDA standard with that over constraining. Um, is that on the roadmap to kind of get addressed as part of the UCOM work? Uh, let me come in, come in. They cannot make it enumerated. They just want an enumeration, and it can't be an enumeration. Um, so, so, John, I think part so with with great reverence to Clem's 
statement of truth. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, actually, they do make it enumerated, which is uh, unfortunately based on the common UCOMS unit list, which, by the way, doesn't have some of the units that are in the required units list, which is the point that we were kind of getting at before. Right. Um, it's backing into the issue that Clem has identified. Mm -hmm. And um, this, this, again, I, I just want to highlight, you know, unfortunately, a lot of everything is simple. Um, the use of UCOM in the context of, um, of standards and models um, is on that edge of, you know, we have this unusual kind of syntax syntactically defined code system not an enumerated list which vsac is not capable of understanding and quite honestly we don't do a good job of, of utilizing in models so lots of complexity in part it gets to this issue of of you know just making sure that all of the standard things that people traditionally use are easy for them to find so that they can ignore the rest of us <laughs> well, along the way, there are a, at least a couple of other syntactics-based units, I mean, entities, and uh, one of them is, um, is HGDS, and we, we actually are putting together with, in a combination of two things to be able to validate those strings, too. They're not units, but they're, it's the same problem. And you know, you know that's defining variants, and it's going to be many, many millennia before we'll get a whole list of them. <clears throat> Yeah, there, I mean, Clem, you're exactly right. You can't you can't enumerate them, but you can um, a middle ground strategy. And 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 what we do at Intermountain, and I think maybe a lot of other systems is is for every you know we we have strings because some of the human the UCOM things are not things that clinicians would understand, uh, and and sort of to get the best of both worlds, we just treat the string as a synonym for the UCOM expression. And so at any time, and and that's, you know, it, it goes back to the page that you, you know, sure. made available that shows the mappings and, and the ability to convert. Then, you know, <clears throat> um, the units, the units of measure are dis retrieved and displayed many more times than what they're calcul than than when they're calculated against so i mean you you'll just display you know lab tests many more times than when you'll actually do decision logic against it or need to yeah. compute against it and so i mean what we do is, again is just we know for every for every single one and we you know we slowly add them all the time because as you said you know you can't you, you can't make a, a finite list because it's you know, it, it slowly grows, but uh, every time that, that there's a new combination, uh, a new expression, if you will, from UCAM, we make, uh, you know, we make a synonym for that. And then uh, you can treat it as a coded field in normal sort of interactions, but anytime you want to, you can convert to the actual UCAM expression and then invoke the library that you referred to you know, to do unit conversions or unit equivalents or uh, all of the very useful calculation-based kinds of activities. And so it's sort of a way of having, you know, having your cake and eating it too. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, so we have a couple more things to talk about and only a little bit less than half an hour left. So maybe we'll just move on real quick. Um, so next thing I want to talk about is the blank license. Realize these are not the most thrilling topics, but, <laughs> but thank you for uh, for for listening. Um, oops. I think I have to go now. Oh, no. I'm I'm <laughs> interested. We, this is a this is an interesting conversation. Okay. All right. Okay. So a little bit of background. So the link copyright notice and license is updated uh, every so often. And there have actually been recent questions coming from a bunch of different places um, related to multiple things, including the link copyright notice itself, uh, third party copyright and terms of use, uh, use of link parts. And so I thought since we had this meeting, it might be a good time to do a quick review related to some of those. And of course, you need to see the license for the full terms and conditions, a legal disclaimer. <laughs> um, okay. So Link License version 5.0, which was published in June um, with the 2.68 release, it has you know, a couple of key changes. 
Um, one, for those of you who remember the old license, um, there were different copyright notices that were required to be included depending on the type of product or service Blank was incorporated into. And so we simplified that and just you know, narrowed it down to one. Um, there's also more flexibility in which fields have to be included. So previously, you know, certain fields uh, were required, um, but now we're more flexible with that. Um, there are also concerns about individuals accepting the license. And so we, you know, we sort of broaden the definition to you, meaning either an individual or the organization specified by an individual. And then there are a few things that we'd actually left out of the license, which we added uh, to the group three artifacts back in June. Um, but the three key things I want to talk about is, so the link copyright notice. So the most important thing is, at least in my mind, that you don't need to include the copyright notice when you're using LOINC for clinical care. And when LOINC codes are used with patient lab results or clinical observations, um, you don't need any copyright notice. So that's, you know, sort of the primary thing. Um, if you're not talking about LOINC codes that are associated with clinical results, but if you're using LOINC in, you know, in different ways, um, then you basically need to include this copyright notice that's here on the screen. And every June, or you know, that's the current schedule, but so basically with every June release, we're gonna update the end year for the copyright to be the current year. And there's been some question about, do we need the end year? And you know, it's kind of a pain to update, but um, I recently checked with the uh, Reagan Streif um, council and he basically said, yes, you must include the end year. So that, you know, that discussion was no longer a discussion because that was decided. Um, third party copyrighted work. So we have a lot, especially in the survey space of third party content. And the reason we include this in LOINC is to allow the clinical data that's associated with this type of content to be standardized. Um, so, you know, different types of survey instruments or other types of assessments. When LOINC terms with third party copyright are included in any products or services, um, you have to include the external copyright notice text in addition to the LOINC copyright notice. And so I think there have been some cases of just the LOINC notice being included and not the external copyright notice. Um, but it's really important that you include both. And then the really key thing is that if you're actually using the assessment, like administering it to patients or you know, building an app or doing something else with it, and not just using it in conjunction with the patient data, you really have to get permission from a third party content owner. And so inclusion in LOINC does not imply permission to use or administer this content uh, without you know, checking with them and seeing what their rules are and following those. So, so you know, and I'm not sure what HL7 is going to do to the, with this because I went out to different fire sites and and there's like Flock and 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 Braden and you know there there's a lot. We're creating all these pain scales so that we can include them in our fire IG. I go out and get copyright permission to put them in Loink. And now I'm going to have to go back to them when they didn't understand LOINC in the first place and say, oh, by the way, now I need another copyright permission to put them in my in in a standard so they can be interoperable. When I told you they were going to be in a standard they could be interoperable with in the first place. Well, I think it depends on like what the IG is doing. So if it's just telling people how to use the assessments, then I think as long as you include the external copyright notice, then that's fine. But if like, let's say you're building an app that's actually administering the assessment to patients, I think in that case, you have to get permission to use the assessment itself. And I don't think that's ever been covered by the, you know, by the link copyright. So you're, th you're thinking that we can put them in a fire profile and be okay. Um, I think so. <laughs> I, I would agree with that. I mean, this, yeah. So, yeah. so this is exactly what I've been <clears throat> trying to get all of our agreements with. You know, these these, these sources of, of of valuable IP. And so, what you said, Susan, uh, you know, to some degree, and I, I'll, I'll even go on record. I'm a little guy; they they can sue me. But <laughs> um, that that what you said is is the intended expectation with regards to 
you know, links discussions with them in terms of inclusion, and it would also be the presumption with regards to HL7. It's certainly been for any uh, MOU that HL7 that has written that I've read that's involving terminology. The intent is to be able to capture the representation of their standard in a standard. So their thing in a standard with the expectation that if that standard is then used to uh, <clears throat> to implement and use in the context of patient care, that entity that's using the standard is then under an obligation to go make sure that they got their IP. But if we're just moving it between standards, like LOINC is now incorporated in another standard, that's not an implementation. And, and uh, no one is you know, creating instance data based on that until they actually implement it. So you know, I think this is pretty clear that, that as long as the IP you know, owner has said, yes, you can use it in, in the standard, in this case, LOINC, then you're just another standard. And yeah. in fact, you're using LOINC because that's where you got it. So, but you know, until someone feels like they've been injured and they have lawyers come after us, maybe we won't know any of this. Yeah, and I don't, I don't think that's how the HTA took it. Um, so. Well, I, I, I know, and I think part of what's going on here is that we need to keep in our minds that not everyone is loink, right? So. Um, I think that there is still a lot of confusion for certain other organizations that have IP content that, that's in the terminology space, i.e. CPT, so the AMA, which tends to be at one end of the spectrum. And everybody kind of thinks like, well, we have to treat this like CPT. And I, and I think the answer is no. I think we treat CPT like CPT and the rest of the stuff is different. But I'm no lawyer. <laughs> Yeah, I think this maybe takes a little bit more work because I'm a little bit more confused um, having, you know, worked on many of these MOUs. I mean, they're, they're separate things. We're, we're saying we're going to create a representation of your thing in LOINC and we're going to distribute it under the LOINC license. So the stuff that's in LOINC is usable under LOINC's license. If you're using their thing, which is maybe a PDF or maybe it's software or maybe it's you know, a service of some kind, well, then you need a license. But if you're using LOINC, and that happens to include these terms that came from or were derived from this other thing, the intent wasn't that everyone had to go find and track that stuff down. It's like, if you're using LOINC, that, this is the license you're using. And that was essentially what they were agreeing to when they sort of signed on the dotted line. Um, and so some of these nuances are different, but the they don't have sort of, I mean, if, if you're a user who's using LUNC, I think the coverage and your obligations is connected to the LUNC license itself and what it says you can do with that content. But it's tricky because if you have something that, let's say, an organization is selling, you know, you have some assessment that they're selling in, in order to, you know, to use it, you have to pay them whatever, a dollar each time you use it or whatever. Potentially, we could have that those concepts in LOINC in order to be able to move the data in a standardized way for the people who have paid for the permission to use that. But having it in LOINC doesn't then give people permission to use it for free. You know, no, I, that's true. No, that's it. That's entirely true. I guess where I'm trying to draw a line is once it is in LOINC, you know, it's there there's not like some extra whole set of rabbit holes you need to sort of jump down to be able to use that thing that is there in LOINC. So, but if you can't arrive at a proper usage of say that total score term without administering an instrument, then you're correct. So there, there is a back and forth, but I guess it, to me, it was unclear, you know, if, if you have something um, that's sort of pretty completely represented in LOINC and what you've got there is usable, like, then I, I think that's a different case than like, oh yeah, by the way, you have to like actually, you know, license the software in order to administer this survey. Of course, then, you know, just the fact that it exists in one doesn't give you that, that right. Or that. Yeah, I, I mean, for me, uh, there's probably a lot of things that aren't covered by this general statement, but you know, when you think of survey instruments in particular, the, 
the idea is, is that I would hope you can reference a survey instrument in the context of a standard, for example, that Susan is talking about in FHIR, and, um, and use the LOINC identifiers for that thing without having to even contact whoever in order to be able to, um, you know, kind of confirm that it's okay to do that. But if an organization then takes that standard and implements it and uses it to go administer, you know, questions and get data from patients, then they are under the obligation to make sure that the IP, you know, requirements are met. And that would be true for anything that HL7 creates, where there's the, the source, you know, of the IP is not HL7, it's somebody else. You're administering it, you're using it, implementing it. You must make sure that all of the IP, uh, you know, requirements are met for you to actually capture clinical data based on that tool. Yeah, there's uh, there's some instances where you we might want to worry, like if they create a questionnaire that they can use to administer the tool. I see where you're going with that, Rob. Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, we can't, <clears throat> we shouldn't try and imagine how other people might, you know, improve, do whatever they might do. That, that is based on something that, that you know, isn't, a derivative, isn't actually LOINC created, right? And in those, in, in those situations, that entity is responsible for kind of figuring that out. But I don't think you are responsible for imagining what they might do in the context of defining the standard. The standard is not an implementation, it's a guide. No. So just in the interest of time, I think, um, no. okay, one more comment. Yeah, it, it it bears some more discussion. I mean, some of you are familiar with a long kind of discussion that's gone on with the Joint Commission on Cancer, uh, where they're, they, they've been reluctant to give copyright, you know, to put their staging, uh, breast cancer staging or other staging terminology in LOINC because um, they they want the revenue that comes from the books and education and and they they sort of understand you know the <laughs> that we could still tell people to go get licensed but if we publish it uh and we're not enforcing it they're saying that that puts us at greater risk so in in some sense they agree philosophically but they they see a great risk to um, their ability to sustain and maintain the the work to create the staging standard, uh, if it's freely available and people you know have to read the copyright and know that they have to pay money, uh, that they won't do that. If it's basically if it's published publicly in LOINC, then they're at risk of of losing that revenue that sustains the development. Can, can I, uh, I that, you're absolutely right, Stan, if we can just stay here for a second on sure. this. So the, and this, this has also come up with X, X12 in a big way um, with some things that are happening with, with H, HL7 and other places. And, and, and their concerns are reasonable concerns. I am absolutely not in any way discounting that concern that if their primary revenue stream around this is being able to find out what's there, right? So if you don't go to them, pay for access to read the questions, they're not clear that they're ever going to have those people who happen to have gotten it out of LOINC or any other place who are going to come back to them and say, yeah, now I'm implementing it and I'll pay you. They have every right to be concerned around that. My answer to that is that what then needs to happen is that all of these organizations need to make easier access to their systems such that uh, standards can be crafted that reference them, but implementers can easily get them. And, you know, one of the, you know, it, when we were doing everything in, with standards and PDFs and things like this, this approach that I'm suggesting was very, very difficult because you had to kind of stick it in the PDF in order for the implementer to read it and understand what they were expected to do. Fire begins to transform that because what can happen is in the context of the standard, you can reference things 
and then uh, the standard owner, ha you can kind of push an obligation to them to make it readily available so that you, for example, can say, here's the value set of, of values that must be exchanged in this particular thing. But unless you actually pay the IP owner to see it, you won't be able to see it even in our standard. But then of course you can't use it anyway because you haven't met the IP requirements. And the way that that works, and X12 is again, they haven't done this yet, but they've kind of committed to trying to figure out how to do it, is to stand up fire servers, just like Loink, exactly like Loink has done. Um, and so if people want to use a Loink list, if Loink was more restrictive in its IP, we could still reference the Loink list and no one could see it in an HL7 standard until they paid to access it via Loink. And that's, I think, a really workable solution. Granted, it's a technology solution that takes time and effort and money to do, but it's a way of solving this problem of you can't see our stuff unless you pay us and yet still support standards incorporation of it. Yeah, that's that's a solution I hadn't thought of. I, yeah, I'm... yeah. I, I, I honestly, I think what Loink has done is a is a a perfect shining example with regards to its fire terminology services that we could promote for other organizations that want to put a paywall up. As long as they don't come back to us and complain. <laughs> yeah, I, I had understood. I mean, m uh, a lot of, if not most. This is my assumption of the customers in Loink do not have copyright constraints. They may have copyrights on them or not. Is that right. true? Right. No, that's, yeah, that's completely true. And so, right. So the vast majority of Loink content has no copyright issues. Even I think most of the third copy, or sorry, third party copyrighted content, you know, they have a notice that you have to include, but I think otherwise, you know, I think there's also no restrictions, but I guess the key is that you need to look, you know, we, like, we don't include that information. And so I, I don't think it's our responsibility to, um, you know, to sort of police or to, you know, to, to convey that information. I think it's the responsibility of the people using the content to figure out if they need to do anything else. Okay. Okay. One more little slight twist is that, mm -hmm. um, Loink now presents a, a questionnaire with most of the survey instruments that's actually a fire questionnaire or it'll be totally fire by December. Um, does that create any new problems? No, because we include the copyright notice. Okay. Right. We should uh, move on to the next topic for time. Okay, sorry, let me just finish this. I just have one last slide on the um, the license. The other thing we could do is talk about the next topic, which is actually the last topic um, at Friday's clinical committee meeting, because it's basically the USCDI uh, recommendations regarding clinical notes. So if that's okay with people, we could do that as well. Um, but let me just go through this really quickly. So just in terms of use of like parts, um, I just want to clarify that they can be, you know, they're used as part of the terms, of course, and they can be used to organize terms and to categorize them. And we've been linking to external terminologies, and so those links can be used, but they really shouldn't be used as a standalone terminology. Um, and a big part of that is because we don't maintain them as strictly as we do like terms. So for parts in one release, it may not necessarily be in the next release. And um, anyway, so that, that was like the last point. Really quickly. Bold that third bullet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have not we need to make sure we remove it from U.S. Core. So, isn't that isn't that also for another reason? No, but that. Well, sorry, I was just gonna. Go so, Rob, no, U.S. Core's usage, though, right, is actually exactly what Swapo said. It's using it to categorize. Uh, well, they did do it exactly that way. That, but it it it's all in the how. Um, and what you do is you use, you can use it in the context of creating a value set. That makes sense. As long as you keep track, as, as Swap now said, you know, it could change out from underneath you. But they were using it as an identifier for um, things that were expected. So they just didn't complete that last step of making a value set and then using that to define the set of actual link things that were to be exchanged. The result was, people were actually using the link point part code to exchange data. 
and I think Rob, this is me and John Snyder. I'm, in case I'm misunderstanding, my concern was is like with the link parts in that fire standard. You, when you're converting from CCDA to fire, you almost have to use that as an intentional value set to create yes. your link code groups. So if those link yes. parts change, uh, which they did for radiology, it kind of creates a little bit of a problem. So is the intention that link fire, or I'm sorry, fire standard won't be using them in that way? Well, they, they shouldn't be. And actually the point, the specific issue that we're kind of talking around is what I, I would agree should be moved to Friday because it's coming up okay. in a sense. It's it's this idea of identifying document subtypes and things like that. So I think, um, but the, you know, Swapna, you know, I, I certainly agree with Swapna's statement, which is that we shouldn't be exchanging patient data using link part codes. And that's what was happening. Well, that's, that's not exactly mm -hmm. what she said, I thought, but she can correct me. What she said is you shouldn't use the whole list as a standard or present promoted as a standard. And I think well, that's- Well, I mean, it's, it's both, right? It's both. Like, I think mm -hmm. you shouldn't use the list of parts as a standard, but you also shouldn't use it for, you know, for patient data. Well, well it's kind of a term, so it's tricky. <laughs> well, but- so I think it is okay to imagine creating a value set that's, that uses a link part as a part of the characteristic that you use to determine what the set of link codes are right. that you should be exchanging. So that's the list that you said. So that, I mean, I think you said something that I don't agree with, which is it, it is fine to take a set of, you know, a link part can be used to identify a set of actual link codes. Yes. And that set of link codes can be a value set for which a standard is expected to, to kind of conform to or something like that. That's, you know, I hope we're not saying that's wrong. No, I completely agree with that. I guess I'm, I'm just saying that um, you shouldn't take link parts, let's say, like I'm just gonna make it up, like let's say a link part for calcium and then annotate a patient, you know, a piece of patient data for calcium with that link part because that's not correct. Yes, and that's a, you and I are in a hundred percent agreement. Okay. That's what I was saying. Okay. Don't exchange patient data with yes. link part cards. Oh, I don't know what, what do we? I mean, what, the other use case though is the, you know just similar to what we already looked at. Make sure I'm understanding what you're saying. I mean, there's a link part code for undetected, <laughs> and we have that's a, a blank answer code. Answer code. Okay. 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 Good clarification. I'm yeah. Yeah. The part codes are the pieces that make up each term, but yeah, no answer lists and answer strings are totally different. I wasn't paying close enough attention. No, it's okay. So, yeah. So, LA, LA terms. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and yeah, I, although I, I don't think we want to have people exchanging patient data with like list identifiers either. Right. So is there a different recommendation on how to categorize link information for presentation to a clinician on a UI other than using link parts? So if you want to, for example, if you want to separate simply your, your laboratory codes from your radiology codes, or if you want to drill down into document ontology yeah, notes and break fine. progress notes from stuff. Right. Sure. Then you can use the parts, but you, yeah, yeah, yeah. but you shouldn't attach the link part code to the document itself that has the patient data in it. Well, that could go out what? in the CDCDA standard as a, um, uh, sorry, it's escaping me right now as a, as a, uh, an additional defining code to, as a categorization code. Right. It would be an attribute, but you wouldn't like, you wouldn't say this cardiol the note for this cardiology or sorry, the code for this cardiology note is LP whatever. Like it should never be an LP whatever. Like that could yeah. be a category. Yeah. So, so John, yeah. though you have raised an interesting question. So the idea that you know, there's oftentimes a a you know a code that represents the thing. Let's call it a type code, and then a code that represents the category of things. And um, and yes, I could imagine situations where the people would say, well, that link part categorizes the things that I'm interested in saying. And I think we will need to talk about that because there's a legitimate potential um, use where link part ca you know, categories are valuable in the context of saying, well, these are all similar in a way that link says they're similar, i.e. that link part. So maybe we should 
think about its use in certain sub sub um, you know subcategories, but but um, but I still stand by what I've said, which is you know these are slippery slopes, and I think that you know based on the way Link has approached the the mm -hmm. publication of Link parts, and um, I think we're it would be very dangerous for us to say that they should be included patient instance data until we kind of work out that example, for example, as one. Um, okay, so so thank you. That was a really interesting discussion. Um, we're right at three forty-five, so I think the USCDI clinical note discussion. I think we should probably should move to uh, Friday, so that we can you know we can let people go about their business for the rest of the day, um, unless there's some big objections to that. Um, the only other thing that you know I was going to do was the call for volunteers, um, and I can just show that slide real quick just while we're wrapping up. Oops. Um, or actually, not there, now I can't find it. <laughs> Sorry. Basically, we're just looking for people to um, sign up for a couple of work groups. And so, here. so if you go to loink.org slash work groups, you'll see we have the consumer names work group and then this brand new sorting out panels, groups, and value sets. Um, and you can uh, sign up for one or both of those. And then the only other thing I want to uh, show was just um, for the like committees. Um, we have a page where you can sign up and there's more information about the committees, but you know, we're always open to more participants. And so if you're interested in participating on any of these committees, just go to like.org slash committee and uh, yeah, and then there's an application and information and stuff. How often will they meet? Wait, these committees? Or the work groups? The work groups. I don't know. We haven't, we just created one today, so <laughs> I don't know. We haven't worked through the details. Well, I mean, it comes to the one about the, you know, the collections and all that kind of stuff. I, I, I would suggest if you get a small group to make a, make a proposal, a draft proposal, and then go to the, a larger group to get feedback on it. But really big groups are tough, especially on these rangy subjects. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I think, I guess in the past, the, you know, we didn't have huge turnout for these groups. And so the way we had handled it was basically working through the issues, you know, in the small group and then bringing it to the committee. In this case, it would be both the lab and the clinical committee, because I think, you know, panels, groups, and value sets apply to both of those. Um, okay. So I think we should wrap it up for today. So thank you so very much for everybody who's been participating um, in today. And I know it's been a long day and especially there's people in um, all sorts of time zones and it's, you know, it's very late. So uh, thank you again. And we will reconvene tomorrow morning um, for our special day of COVID workshops. <laughs>